Uh, we also get a couple questions about, well, if we're going to talk about multiple people under this condition, uh, all related to the same subject matter, and let's say it's three people, two people want it held in executive session, one person wants it held in open session, what are we going to do in that type of situation? Uh, we've made clear through our findings that to the extent that the discussions can be segregated, they should be, and each person's wishes should be carried out. If the public body is going to be having a discussion, uh, perhaps evaluating all the candidates all at once, and the discussion cannot be segregated, then it would be appropriate to have it uh, according to the majority in that case. Um, you also see here that, that uh, it begins with discussions are permitted in executive session. We interpret this strictly. That means that voting is not permitted in executive session under A1. Uh, and the last point I was going to make on this slide is that uh, we had a case earlier this year, Brian versus Woonsocket Housing Authority. And this is one of the examples where this uh, exception is kind of interpreted too broadly by some, by some public bodies. Uh, the Housing Authority went into executive session not specifically to discuss the job performance, character, or physical or mental health of a person, but they wanted to talk about the overall structure of its organization, personnel alignments, um, what, what the future held for them, personnel-wise and structure-wise, but without discussing any particular person's job performance, character, or physical or mental health. And that exceeded the scope of the access to public, uh, exceeded the scope of the Open Meetings Act. Uh, so be aware of that. Um, exception A is essentially the same thing as the exception that we just talked about, but just on the school committee side, related to students. Uh, and again, the student has to be provided advanced written notice so that they can have that executive session discussion held in open session. It's kind of interesting that uh, in the Open Meetings Act, these are the only two situations where somebody has to be providing actual notice. The rest of the, the notice requirements are public notice. Uh, these are the actual notice requirements. Uh, on page 25 of the bound book, uh, you see that sessions or work sessions pertaining to collective bargaining or litigation are appropriate for executive session. Um, we've articulated what that standard is, permits discussions not only of pending litigation, but also litigation that has been threatened or is imminent. Uh, closed session is also permitted when litigation is reasonably anticipated and the public body is receiving frank appraisals from its attorney for discussing strategy. Um, be cognizant and careful of this exception. Um, you know, we're all lawyers too, and it's very easy to contemplate that uh, almost anything could lead to litigation. That's not the standard. And we review these, uh, when these complaints come in, we review them very carefully. Um, it's not whether something could lead to litigation. That's that would lead to uh, you know, an adding to the situation. But uh, you know, be careful of that and make sure that it's, it's legitimate litigation and under that standard that we've articulated because we do review those carefully. And under exception nine, hearings or discussions on agreements filed pursuant to the CBA. Uh, if you're going to go into executive session under this, make sure it is pursuant to the CBA. Uh, votes. We talked about, I just mentioned that in some situations where, uh, particularly the first exception where it says that a public body can go into executive session for discussions, uh, that voting is not permitted, or voting is permitted under some of the other exceptions uh, that don't have that discussion language. If a vote is taken in the executive session, it has to be disclosed as soon as the open session is reconvened. Um, that's important. Within two weeks of any vote, uh, a record listing how each member voted on each issue has to be available at the office of the public body for public consumption. Uh, there's an exception to both of these, and that's where disclosure would jeopardize uh, any strategy of negotiation or investigation that was undertaken in executive session. Uh, so to the extent that it, uh, it would jeopardize uh, any of those interests, the public body does not have to articulate the, the, uh, articulate the vote. In those situations, you should probably come out of executive session indicate that the vote has been taken, but it's not being disclosed for these reasons um, because of the jeopardy. Um, once the jeopardy dissipates, there is an affirmative obligation on the public body to disclose that vote. Um, so that vote doesn't stay, stay sealed uh, forever. Uh, it does have to be disclosed once the jeopardy dissipates. One of the more important cases that we had this year, and I'll give the site also, is Carlin versus Miss Providence School Committee. It's an open meeting finding 09-12. Um, in that case, the school committee went into executive session and they, uh, they had a discussion about instituting a parole action. Uh, we got a complaint that a parole action had been instituted and the school committee voted in executive session but did not disclose the executive session vote. Uh, 
we got the school committee's response, their response was, yes, we discussed the parole action, uh, but we didn't vote on it, we just came to a consensus about it. Um, whether it's called a vote, or a consensus, or some other phrase you want to use, um, we made very clear in the parliament fighting that when you arrive at that decision, you have to disclose it. Um, again, we're going to look more at the substance rather than what you call it. Obviously, if that were the case and a consensus didn't have to be disclosed, uh, essentially, no, no vote would ever be taken if we just reach consensus. Um, so, under the umbrella of the Open Meetings Act and, and, the, and the, the vote and the consensus really being articulated to, to and defined to be the same thing, um, you know, be aware of that. Uh, it's kind of an interesting finding and talks about the definitions of vote and, and uh, consensus a little bit. We're going to more depth uh, in the finding. The Open Meetings Act requires two types of notice. A public body must publish their annual notice at the beginning of each calendar year and a supplemental notice 48 hours before every meeting. What does this notice consist of? For the annual notice, the annual notice must consist of the dates, times, and locations of the regularly scheduled meetings and it must be available to the public upon request. Something I want to note on that is that although many public bodies do not have regularly scheduled meetings, they still need to make a document to that effect available to the public and post it on the Secretary of State's website. As for the 48-hour supplemental notice, this must include the date, time, and location of all meetings and the date that this notice was posted. <coughs> and perhaps the most important part and the most controversial for the most not understood and most complaints are filed on is the statement specifying the nature of the business to be discussed. What is the statement specifying the nature of the being discussed? The Rhode Island Supreme Court considered this in 2005 in the Tanner case, and they said that the point of the legislator was trying to come up with a flexible standard without any magic words, but that what a public body should aim for would be to, by the totality of the circumstances, fairly inform the public of the nature of the business to be discussed or acted upon without misleading them as to what will be discussed. Um, some things I want to mention are things we see on agenda, which if you think about it in the context of Tanner, you can see why they're really um, not in accordance with the Open Meetings Act. But frequently we see the title, New Business and Old Business. Now, if you have this on your agenda, but underneath you list out what the new business you wish to discuss is, what the old business you wish to discuss is, that's fine. But if the agenda items simply say new business and old business and they're used as a springboard to discuss what the public body wants to discuss, this does not let the public know what it is that you're going to be discussing. Another one that's been a lot on agendas is things that say along the lines of report by superintendent or report by some other individual not on the public body. Well, again, this doesn't tell the public what it is you're going to be discussing. This one is easily remedied. For instance, if somebody was going to discuss the budget, it could say report by the treasurer on the budget, and then the public would know what it is that's going to be discussed at that meeting, and they would know whether or not they should attend it. Something else that comes up quite a bit is counselor's personal privilege. And from what I understand, this is being used for various members of the public body to discuss whatever it is that they wish to discuss this meeting. Um, I actually had a discussion with an attorney the other day, and I was talking to him about this, and I said, you know, that really shouldn't be on your agenda. And he said to me, well, this is on every public body's agenda. Well, unfortunately, that does not make it not a violation of the Open Meetings Act, and these really shouldn't be on your agendas. One of the things that we've talked about at past open government summits, and which we want to spend a little bit more time on, is amending the agenda. Uh, it's, I believe it's on page 26, and this is one of page 26 of the down law. And this is one of the situations where uh, school committees and every other public body are treated a little bit differently. Um, so first, we're going to talk about everybody else except the school committees. Um, one of the things we want to do is kind of give some practical advice. Um, you know, Lauren will spend some time talking about how specific your agendas have, have have to be. And we recognize and we've heard from, from people in public bodies that it kind of puts them in a little bit of a catch-22, that they want to make their agenda specific, but at the same time, if their agenda is too specific, um, you know, with the end of the flow of the discussion, it may prevent them from discussing something else that comes up during the course of the meeting. 